Howdy from Music City. I'm John Merchant, and I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee, home of some of the world's best songwriters, musicians, and producers. As the center for country music, the city of Nashville includes must-see destinations like the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Grand Old Opry. It hosts the annual Country Music Awards, and it features some of the greatest recording studios in the world, right here on Music Row, including this one. Come on, let's check it out. Today we're here to explore Rhodes' incredibly versatile NT2A microphone. To demonstrate the power and flexibility of the NT2A, we'll be recording an entire session with an NT2A on every instrument. Beyond that, we've included the multi-track of the session along with this video. So if you're curious to hear how the NT2A sounds on a wide variety of sources, you can check them out for yourself right here. For our session, we're working in Studio A at Sony Tree Studios, located at 8 Music Square West. Studio A has hosted an amazing array of artists, like Jewel and Sync, Gretchen Wilson, The Mavericks, and Olivia Newton-John, just to name a few. The NT2A features a large, one-inch dual diaphragm capsule and was designed to capture a wide, smooth frequency balance. This pattern selector allows you to switch between three different polar patterns, Omni, short for omnidirectional, captures sound from all directions equally well. Cardioid, this heart-shaped pattern listens for sound more from the front of the mic and rejects sound that comes in from the back. And bidirectional, with its distinctive figure eight pattern, captures sound on the front and rear, but not from the sides. With these patterns, you can focus the NT2A so that it only captures the aspects of any instrument you want and reduces the level of unwanted noise. I'll show you some specifics about how to use these to best advantage when we start miking up the band. In addition to the pattern select, there are two additional controls. The high pass filter allows you to roll off the low bass captured by the NT2A. At the zero position, there is no roll off and the mic presents the full wide bandwidth of the source. When you listen, however, you may find there is unwanted noise, like air conditioner rumble or too much low frequency boom, coming from the source. In these situations, you can engage the filter and gently roll off the extreme lows at 40 Hz, or be a bit more aggressive and roll off everything below 80 Hz. Like with any of these choices, let your ear be the judge of which setting works best. When it sounds right, it is right. Because the NT2A is quite sensitive, there may be times you need to adjust its overall output level. On sources that are particularly loud, you can engage a 5 or 10 dB pad to reduce the level at the preamp. There is no undo for distortion once it's been recorded that way, so you really should try to avoid it right from the beginning as best you can. Of course, you can always make level and EQ adjustments on the console or in the mix, but there are lots of practical advantages to recording it sounding good in the first place, rather than using processing like EQ and compression to try to fix it after the fact. Now that we've seen these controls, let's have a look at some of the ways we can use the NT2A for our session. Okay, so we're here in the tracking space, all the band gear is set up, and now it's time to get started miking everything up. Uh, typically I start with the drum kit because it's so complicated. There's an awful lot here and usually you use quite a few mics so you have extra choices later on. Um, now typically what I wouldn't do is use one type of microphone for the whole kit and in fact for the whole band but um, we're trying something different today. We're actually going to show how versatile the Rode NT2A really can be. So we're using it kind of on everything and we're going to start with the drum kit and beyond that let's see how it looks like on the kick drum right here. So we're here at the kick drum, and when I record a kick, I almost always use two mics. I'll use one on the inside to catch the attack, and then one on the outside to catch more of the resonance or the, the ring of the kick itself. So now that we're here at the mic, we can uh, adjust its position to capture the best version of the source that we can. The further away we go, the more uh, of the low end we'll catch, but the less attack we'll have. If we move it closer, we lose a bit of the low end, but we'll get more of the smack of the sound. Additionally, we want to look at the front panel 
and make sure that the pad is turned on. In this case, we have the 10 dB pad turned on. I have it in the directional pattern, so it's in uh, cardioid. And uh, I have the filter set at zero, so it's going to be completely flat. And once the two are placed, so I can now choose between the interior one to catch more of the attack or the outer one to catch more of the resonance, we're ready to move on to the snare. Okay, so now it's time to look at the snare drum. I'm actually using three separate mics on the snare, two above and one below. The NT2A that's set on the top is three fingers above the rim, aimed as best I can as the, at the center of the drum. Um, the 10 dB pad is turned on, and the polar pattern is cardioid. I really want this mic to listen to just the snare drum and exclude everything else, especially the hi-hat. Um, I am worried that he's going to hit the drums really hard, and so I have a second snare mic on the top. It's the um, M1. It's a dynamic mic. It's a little bit more robust. It's not quite as sensitive, so when he really whacks it, it's going to, be, uh, it's going to handle those, those bigger transients. Uh, additionally, I'm using an NT2A on the bottom of the snare to catch the rattle of the snares. Um, I don't always use that mic in the mix, but sometimes it's nice to have it available if you want a buzzier snare. Um, again, it needs the 10 dB pad to be switched on, and it too needs to be in the cardioid pattern. Um, beyond that, then it's time to look at the hi-hat mic. I'm actually using a fixed cardioid pattern NT5, and I've tried to position it so that the, it captures just the hi-hat, and that the hi-hat itself actually serves as a baffle or a barrier between the mic and the snare drum. So we really get just the hi-hat as best we can focus. So let's move on to the toms. Uh, the toms are placed similarly to the snare drum, though they're a little bit further away because the toms are more resonant. We want to catch more of the uh, tone of the instrument, and that big one-inch diaphragm on the anti-2A catches that. Um, we want to make sure there's no roll-off on either of those, but we do want to make sure that the 10 dB pads are on on both toms. We back them off just a little bit further away from the instrument than is on the snare. And once all those are in place, all of those mono mics are, are ready to go, now it's time to look at our stereo uh, overheads and our stereo room mics. So stereo overheads are placed, probably unsurprisingly, over the head of the drummer. And this is an example of coincident pairs, where the two mics are as close together as you can get them without actually making physical contact. Um, this particular uh, array is called the Blue Mine pair, and it's one of the oldest stereo pairs that exists. In fact, it was the first stereo pair that ever existed. And it's two um, bi-directional microphones, that is to say two figure eights, and um, one facing the left side, one facing the right, and they're listening down. They're kind of capturing the overall sense of the drum kit, sort of focusing on the cymbals, but really capturing everything. But in addition to listening down, they also listen up because they're in the figure eight pattern. So they're actually listening to the space or the sound of the drum kit above us. And in a room that sounds this good, you don't want to exclude that sound. You want to include it. So um, it's very mono compatible. It works well over um, in mono, but in addition to that, it has this great sense of space. So that's the blue mine technique. So the last mics for the drum kit are the room mics, and for this I'm using two of the NT2As. They're spaced apart roughly 40 centimeters, and they're all set to omni mode, which means they're listening in all directions. They're not focused one way or another. Um, there's no pads, and there's no filter turned on on these, so they're wide open and clear. The idea with these mics is they capture the overall impression of the drum kit, as if you were standing in the room. They catch a lot of the ambience of the space. And so with all of these options, we get lots of great ways to make this drum kit sound exactly the way we want. So we're here at the piano, 
And there's so many different ways to capture this instrument that you have a whole bunch of choices in front of you. The way I like to do it is with a stereo pair over the hammers to capture a really bright, aggressive sound, in particular for a pop music, where we want it to stand out from the rest of the, or, or to compete with the rest of the tracks. Um, I've also used a slightly different stereo array. On the drums overhead, we used a coincident pair. Um, for the room mic, we used a space pair. And over the strings of the piano, what I've used is a near coincident pair. It's kind of a, a halfway point between the two. The mics are fairly close together, somewhere from 15 to 30 centimeters together. Um, and they are faced away from each other, so they're kind of covering out left to right. Um, in this case, they're kind of one's covering the low strings and the other's covering the high strings. And together they create this lovely wide stereo image. The polar pattern is a directional. They are set to the cardioid so that they only listen down. I'm really not interested in the sound that's skipping off the top lid of the piano. Um, I have no pad on there, um, but I do have a slight low end roll off. Everything below 40 hertz is rolled off in, on these um, mics. And part of the reason for that is that I added a third mic below the piano to mic the bottom of the sounding board to catch some of the weight or heft or some extra body, and I have that available on a separate fader within the session. So that mic is also in cardioid. There's no roll off and no filter, but all those are used in combination to, again, be able to shape the overall sound of the piano. You can compare that to the way the B3 is mic'd. And actually, when we're miking a B3, we're, we're miking the Leslie cabinet, the spinning speaker cabinet. And the way we're going to mic that up is we're going to use two NT5s, or the way I've mic'd it up, is to use two NT5s on le left and right, either side, so we get this nice wide stereo, especially when the, the um, as they slow down or speed up the speed of the rotating speaker, you really get this great dramatic image. And in addition to the two mics on the top to kind of catch the high, smaller speakers, there's a single lower speaker that spins on the bottom, and I've used a single NT2A to capture that. Um, with no roll off um, and no pad, but a cardioid position, again, because I only want to capture that low end, not the two high ends. And all of those give us lots of options for making all these keyboards sound great.